I'm really excited to be moderating our first panel this afternoon. Um, and for any confused people in the audience, yes, normally I sit over at that desk over there with a headset on. Um, but uh, Chris and the, the gang, the XDS gang, asked me to moderate this panel today, um, which I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be here. Uh, although my work is outside of the games industry, uh, I work as an event production professional. I've worked in the creative industries for the better part of a decade. Um, and the conversation we're having today about diversity is one that spans industries. Uh, and obviously today we're going to be talking specifically about the games industry, um, but I think it's a relevant conversation uh, across industries. So I'm, I'm certainly thrilled to be here today. Um, we're also grateful to Women in Animation for sponsoring uh, this panel today and for really bringing this discussion to the forefront. Um, it's really the first of its kind, I think, at XDS, uh, and it's an important one to be having. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, the first person is really the champion of this, this uh, topic, uh, and she was really instrumental in bringing uh, this conversation to XDS. Uh, and uh, she is not only the co-president of Women in, in Animation, um, but she also is the VP of Business Development at Technicolor. Uh, so Christy, please join me up on stage. <laughs> Uh, next up is another board member of Women in Animation, uh, Julianne Cromit. Uh, she is also the Entertainment Industry Educator in Chief at Google. Julianne, please join us. Uh, next, we have Dilber Mann, who is the Senior Project Manager at Capcom Vancouver, also an XDS Advisory Board member. Uh, next, we have Neil Thompson, Director of Art and Animation at BioWare. And finally, Lisa Wood, who is the Senior Producer at Warner Brothers Games in Montreal. So thanks for being here today, guys. Um, We've had some lively discussion coming up to today uh, on the subject of diversity. Uh, and one of the things we, I think, have all agreed on is that this is a very broad topic. Um, and, and I think that there's always a bit of um, sort of complexity around topics like diversity uh, because you sort of want to walk the walk and talk the talk at the same time. And that's something that we've all been conscious of, I think, in the lead up to today, is making sure that um, we address the fact that this is a broad subject matter. We can't even begin to imagine uh, that we would cover all of those complexities today. Um, so we've really decided to um, focus on a couple of key uh, subjects are a couple of key areas today. What's interesting too, and, and we've all been talking about this today, is this sort of theme of diversity seems to be coming up quite a bit over the last couple of days at XDS. Um, we had the wonderful presentation to SFU yesterday at the welcome reception, um, where a bursary is now um, being sponsored by XDS uh, for female students. Um, in, uh, in their technical program at SFU. Uh, so it's, it's a conversation that seems to be on people's minds, which is, I think, quite exciting. Um, but it, again, it's, it's one of those um, sort of tricky subjects where there's lots of different ways that you can approach it. So what we're going to be talking about today is really through a lens of external development for obvious reasons, um, but really wanting to provide some, some culturally relevant but also industry relevant context. Um, we'll talk a little bit about stats today, but we certainly won't bore you with them. Uh, but we want to sort of frame up the discussion with, a, with some context setting. Um, and Christy specifically is going to be talking about this in just a second here. But you'll maybe be interested to note when we think about the sort of XDS report card, 35% uh, of our speakers are female, 23% uh, of our attendees are female, and over 35 countries are represented by the people at XDS. So, by and large, we're doing okay on the diversity front, but what these stats show us is, is that there is more to be done and there's certainly an opportunity uh, to do more there. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to start with uh, really a, a bird's eye view, what, the, the 10,000 foot view of where we're at um, in the industry. And, and Christy, I'll turn to you first uh, to talk specifically about gender representation in the gaming industry and some of the things that WIA is doing. Sure. Thanks, Katie. 
Um, so in preparation leading up to this panel, I did some research and looked up some of the recent studies on this. And, um, you know, women make up over 40% of game players and people who purchase games, yet only about 22% of people working in game development are female. Um, and about 76% of the uh, people working in game development are, are white. So, um, you know, there is still room to grow. Um, the good news is that the needle has moved uh, quickly in uh, the games business. In comparison, uh, in animation at large, uh, we've only gone about 3% in 10 years um, to now 22%. And the good news is that in the games business in just a few years, we've gone from 11% female to 22% female. And that varies based on the types of roles. Um, you know, for producers, it's typically about, around 22%. Uh, programs and engineers are about 5%, and artists and animators are around 9%. But roughly overall, it's about 22%. And, um, you know, again, given that 40% uh, 40, 40 or more of uh, people who play games are female, um, it seems like they're being underrepresented in mm -hmm. the current product out there. And that's, a, I think, an interesting um, sort of distinction and that we've talked about as a group is the difference between sort of um, industry representation and then representation within games as well. And, and the two are, are linked and, and obviously the stats are quite different. So there's, there is a, a gap to bridge there. Um, Dilber, can you talk to us a little bit, um, maybe more generally, about working environment? What is di how does diversity impact our working environment? Obviously, we're talking about workforce quite specifically around the stats that Christy mentioned, but what about sort of the feeling of a workforce and, and the opportunities that diversity gives us? So I'm from Vancouver, and you see cultural diversity all around you. Um, in the workplace, uh, there's a lot of rep ethnic representation in the workforce. Um, especially at Capcom Game Studio Vancouver and a number of other developers here in Vancouver. Um, but uh, I think that we, especially myself, I think I take that for granted because mm -hmm. when you look at it from another perspective, especially overseas working with external partners, uh, you see that there's this initiative um, from different companies to reach out internationally, uh, to find internationals and pull them in to help create more diversification and cultural diversification within their workforce. Mm -hmm. And the well, reason for it is well, their clients are globally, like all around the world. And uh, it's really interesting just kind of making that, making this statement now because it's almost like the games industry's um, move towards scaling through distributed development has um, impacted diverse uh, diversity within the workforce. And so we're seeing this kind of movement across all companies globally to become more culturally diverse. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it's kind of amazing to think of it that way, um, having said it now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there's a there's an opportunity there um, to be leaders in, in when you look at distributed development and, and the work that you know everyone in this room is really doing, that there's an opportunity there to, to be leaders and to sort of lead by example, which is exciting. Um, Lisa, you had talked about um, in some of our early discussions around sort of the practical realities of building a studio. I wonder if you could comment on that, you know, when, when you're up against a deadline of shipping a game, what does that look like in, in when you're building a team and what are some of the implications? Well, that's, that's exactly it. When we start building a team to ship a game, it, we don't have necessarily the time to whatever time we want to take to build a team. There is deadlines that we need to make to ship that game. So when you have that pressure, what do you look for? You look for senior talent. And then based on that need for senior talent, the diversity of applicants that you get is directly related to the seniority of the talent. When there was less people getting into video games, there's less diversity, and those are the senior talent that we have now. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being our applicants are less diverse because we're looking for seniority. Well, and this is something we talked about as far as education goes as well, and, and an interesting tie-in to the SFU presentation yesterday is that the, there's a significant gap between women in um, the, the sort of education system in you know, STEM education and, and related um, areas of study, and then how that translates to the workforce, which is, I think, again, an opportunity uh, when we think about how women can be mentored or minorities can be mentored into those kinds of roles. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, 60 to 70 percent of animation schools, uh, the students are female mm -hmm. these days, and still only 20, roughly 20 percent are getting the creative yeah, roles. So, so it's just not that's, that's a big gap. That's a disconnect that we've been looking at a lot and trying to figure out how to, how to fix. Fantastic.
So Dilber, you bring up a good point about um, external development really being an area of opportunity. Um, and, and I wonder if, you know, before we talk about the, the opportunity side, if you can speak a little bit to maybe some of the challenges when you're working with a distributed workforce um, around diversity, some of the cultural sensitivities, and, and maybe how you overcome some of those things. Well, I guess it's something that I, I touched on um, last year's XDS about um, uh, Essentially, it was it had to do with uh, don't doubt capability, mm. and you know we work with so many different. Uh, in the past decade, I've worked with so many different um, external partners uh, trying to scale uh, production, and each of them with their different cultural differences and and um, uh, ethnical backgrounds and whatnot. Uh, I guess I can best describe it through. An example. Um, I can take character art as an example. Something I brought up last year as well. Um, I was working with a company in um, Shanghai uh, that was doing great work, and their artists were very well-rounded individuals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, essentially, they were Mike Michelangelo's, if you will. <laughs> um, but uh, the work content was really great, and I had an opportunity to work uh, in a remote part of. Um, uh, China uh, to work with another team and initially the results were very poor and uh, I could have just stopped right there and be like okay I'm not gonna work with these guys but um, there was actual like, looking into it a little bit further there was actual cultural uh, differences with how they grew up in the industry there the industry wasn't as mature as it was mm. in Shanghai and uh, a lot of the um, uh, the young artists going through school uh, they were uh, kind of focused more on a trades mentality, and so they had a very short time period that didn't allow them to become Michelangelo's, mm. if you will. Uh, you know, we're here, um, you know, we're spending, you know, th four years uh, doing a fine arts degree and continuing onwards. So uh, the culture was a little bit different there. It was more of a speed through and get into the workforce. Um, but what I did find um, investigating further is that there was specialization uh, within uh, each of the artists that I was working with there. So not in the same way that we have specialization for, say, character artists and environment artists and vehicle artists, something like that. It was even more granular, mm. taking it down even further. So I started to see that, you know, this guy over here is really good at doing faces, and this guy here is really good at doing proportions, and this person here is really good at doing clothing, um, and then this person here was really good at doing materials. Uh, so, you know, just thinking about that, I started to try to pair them up, and we, we were successfully able to pair up 16 people in a kind of a four, three to four person pods. Mm -hmm. And uh, each individual actually built up the characters on their own. They had ownership of their own characters for the project. This was for a AAA console project, a PC console project. But um, Artist number one essentially was getting feedback about proportions from artist number two, and then also giving feedback about um, faces to artist number three and artist number four. So they were kind of complementing each other's sure. uh, and quite collaborative. Weaknesses? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so we actually found that we got comparable results, and in some cases even better results than we were getting from the team that was working in Shanghai. So after that experience, it was a couple of years back, I think it was 2011, after that experience, I, I just said to myself, don't doubt capability. Mm. It's always waiting to be unlocked. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit to speak to cultural differences and being open to um, considering what they are and how to um, uh, leverage them for, for, for success. And for potentially an even better product. Definitely, which yeah. Is, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, Neil, I, I want to turn to you um, in some of your work uh, at BioWare and, and, and really looking to some of the work that you've done as, as a, an interesting case study and something that we can learn from. Um, and I'm wondering if you can really talk to us about the opportunities that you see uh, in external development around diversity. Sure, I think uh, you know Bioware is an interesting uh, test test case in this. Uh, the games that we make are, I think, as as diverse as any in the in the games community. Uh, from uh, we make RPGs, if, if people don't know that, uh, the, the the value of an RPG is its a, its ability to, to to immerse the player in in a world of their own their own making. Uh, so, from a character perspective, we allow male, female, uh, ethnic, 
minority, whatever, whatever you like. What I find interesting, and you know, we, we do our own research, and we know that there is an extremely large uh, contingent of female fans for the, for the type of games that we make. What I think is interesting is that from a developer standpoint, we, we don't necessarily see that transfer into the workforce. Uh, and I think there's, there's innumerable reasons for this. Uh, you know, I, I visit a lot of universities and, and, and visit games courses that have sprung up of over the last sort of five to ten years. And from, from when, I, when I first started visiting these studios in the UK, these universities in the UK, they would be predominantly male, young males, uh, young white males as well. Uh, and this, this has changed, and, and to the point now where they, you know, I visit the University of Alberta a lot, which is a huge, huge course. It's got some, got some great, great uh, initiatives going there. And it's more a 50-50 split between male and female. But when it comes to the recruitment side of the business and when I'm looking to hire into the studio, I very rarely see uh, resumes from women. Uh, and one of my, well, my, my, my sole priority really as, a, as, a, uh, as the leader of the art and animation department is to bring the best possible talents I can into the studio. And I can only diversify in terms of gender and ethnicity if I see those reels and those portfolios in front of me. And really one of the questions that, that you know, we discussed on the, on the call was wh wh where is the disconnect between the, 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 the women in the university courses and then the people moving into the, into the industry? And I would also suggest that um, what I've observed over the last, I mean, this has always been true of games, is that the, the, the technical abilities of the developers is, is constantly on the increase. Right? It's been a steady increase of what we would expect from any individual developer, and it's, and it's, it's an exponential curve. I mean, with the, with the advent of the latest, um, latest hardware, just the, the dependency burden on any asset or any piece of animation that has to be developed within a studio is so great that the technical understanding of each individual developer is so high that it, it, it's finding those unique people in an industry of, well, I don't know how, how big the games community is, but it's not huge, let's say 10,000 people, I don't know, globally. Uh, we're talking subsets of subsets of individuals, uh, and I don't know how to solve that problem. <laughs> We don't have to solve it today, but I can try. hopefully we'll start. Um, so it's interesting when we look at sort of you know the state of state of the union. Let's let's say um, you know there's there's a difference between sort of facts and figures or facts and feelings. There's the stats that we've just talked about, but there's also this feeling that we have that there's an imbalance. And and I think Neil, you just highlighted that. Um, and and Christy, I want to just turn back to you here before moving to Julianne, who's I think really our resident expert on uh, diversity in the workforce, um, you know, what is, what is the difference when we look at the facts that say 22% of the workforce is female, 76% of the workforce is, is white, um, uh, you know, but then we look at people's individual experiences within the workforce and within the sort of um, more specifically uh, the gaming industry or in games themselves. How do we reconcile that and, and really is there a way to start bridging that gap? We spend a lot of time at WIA talking about how we uh, can move the needle. And we're approaching it in a variety of different ways. And I think this can uh, count both for you know, gender diversity as well as, as diversity at large. But um, we talk about building creative leaders. So we have a mentorship program. Um, we talk a lot about uh, if she can see it, she can be it. And so we showcase um, success stories, women directors, women show creators, et cetera. Um, and therefore, you know, our members can see an example and then they can, they can believe in them, you know, that they can do it too. Um, so we do that. We uh, do outreach to schools. Um, another thing that Dilbert touched on, uh, if your goal at your company is really to have a diverse workforce, I know that the knee-jerk reaction is often, you know, uh, to, to hire who you know. Um, but, you know, it, it, you can really cultivate that talent. You know, you can, if you want to hire more women, um, then give them tips on how to make their portfolio more uh, appealing to uh, recruiters. Um, so, you know, basically we want to elevate uh, diverse creative voices, uh, which will enrich the culture by uh, having more diverse media. Um, and then we'll also help to um, promote diversity in hiring. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, you know, a female showrunner or director, they're going to hire 
more women. So um, elevating uh, and showcasing creative voices, we're doing a shorts program also toward that effect. Um, so there's a lot of different things that companies can do to initiate programs and move the needle. Um, you know, one thing that we did with our studio in India, and you know, we're also uh, up against a lot of cultural um, uh, challenges, but you know, the first time that I visited the studio, we only had about 4%, uh, 3% um, females working at the studio, and I you know, kind of gave a big talk and talked a lot about it, and they initiated a program where if you referred a woman that got hired, you got a bonus, and so by the time I visited the next year, it was 7% female. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's almost a 50% increase. So there are things that companies can do, you know, if you really are serious about diversity, there are um, you know, strategies that you can put into place that will help to even that out and move the needle. And you know, our goal at WIA is 50-50 by 2025. That's our call to action. And you know, we intend to do everything we can to, um, to find you know, a world with a diverse balance. That's great. Um, Juliana, I'd, I'd like to turn to you um, for, for sort of, I guess, a two-part question. Um, you know, we've talked about unconscious bias and the role that that may play in diversity. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about some, you know, fairly significant examples here today, but probably they're largely unintentional um, in, in terms of that imbalance. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on unconscious bias. And then I want to move into sort of, uh, again, back to that shifting the needle conversation is what are organizations doing and what can they do? Um, and maybe you can talk specifically about your role at Google and, and what it is that, that you're working towards around diversity. Sure, absolutely. Man, that was a loaded question. Awesomeness. Uh, I can give you a recap if you need it. Oh, no, we're going we're gonna to be good. <laughs> it's going to be good. Um, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Christy, thanks for that tee up to you about our conversations at WEA. I think this is um, a really important part of the conversation, and I think it goes to some of the examples given earlier, is you really have to think about also how unconscious bias, so for those of you who've not heard the phrase before, unconscious bias or implicit bias, are the shortcuts that our brains take because of the amount of data we have to process at any given moment. It is the unintended consequences of having to think very quickly. Um, and we are more likely to slip into those unconscious biases when we're rushed and we have no time or money or any other strain, which is what we were talking about earlier. Um, and we at Google talk a lot about this, both as an organization and externally, because we feel like a lot of this is what's key to cracking the nut. It's the underlying pieces, right? So if, for example, you're seeing a drop off between graduates you know, in a program and who you might want to hire on the other end, what might be happening there are a couple of things. There might be an unconscious like me bias playing out on both sides, which is that we tend to hire people or be around people who are like us. And that doesn't necessarily mean just gender. That can just mean you went to the same university or that you come from the same place. And what's amazing is Sometimes it's about changing processes, not necessarily people, to try to make that fairer. Um, we've done a whole lot of different experiments at Google um, in terms of hiring processes and cultural processes, but one of the things that I always find really compelling is the example around orchestras. I don't know if you all know this, but back in the 1970s and 80s, orchestras and symphonies around the world were actually predominantly male. Very similar statistics to what we see in games and what we see in entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody had the bright notion of, well, what if we put a curtain up during auditions and that way we wouldn't see who was auditioning, it was completely blind. And weirdly, not much changed. There was a slight increase, but nothing monumental. And somebody else had the bright idea that maybe we should put carpet on the stage so that nobody could hear the sound of the shoes as somebody walked on the stage. In one year, overnight, 50-50, male, female, 50-50. And I love that example because it's a creative example and it's something that is considered a subjective process, which is auditioning, you know, how somebody plays music. But it was two tweaks to an existing process that caused an overnight change. And so I think something for everybody here to think about is, what are your processes on a daily basis that you engage in, in your organizations, in your creative processes, um, in your design and development processes, that if you made one or two tweaks, say, um, in your hiring process, you took the names off resumes, 
or if you, you know, started to source from different places where you hadn't looked for talent before and invite them in the door and then do it blind from there. That's another way to think about it. Um, those small tweaks could have actually significant impact, just like the orchestras. And by the way, that statistic stays today. It's still 50-50. Um, and so something for you all to think about and, and gnaw on after you leave here today is sort of where could I make those tweaks and what might that mean? Um, and so that's really, I think, a way to think about unconscious bias in a productive uh, place from this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and then part two is, like, why the heck am I here and what do I do for Google and how do I talk about unconscious bias all the time? Um, I'm the entertainment industry educator in chief, which is a made up title. I made up my job. Thank you, Google. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and what my team does is that we work across the entertainment industry, and we're actually starting to work in the gaming industry, looking at portrayals and perceptions of computer scientists and engineers on screen. Because all the research has shown that women and underrepresented minorities, in the case of the US, it's blacks and Hispanics, if they can't see themselves on screen, literally, there's not a vision that I belong there. That's it's true. It's 30% almost of the decision for girls in high school and college to pursue computer science in a study that we did was their perception of the career, that mm. sort of nerdy hacker guy who's sort of disheveled and wears glasses and sits in a closet and has no friends, that sort of uh, you know trope, had permeated so deeply that girls were saying things like, that's not for me, I'm not smart enough for that, um, that's for the people over there, and I can't do it with my friends. And that was just under adult encouragement in terms of the reasoning. And so at Google, we said, wait a minute, if we need more people to become computer scientists and engineers, then we need to address this sort of perception thing. And that's what my team does. So we work across all mediums, looking at those portrayals and influencing them. Um, and a great example that I think ties really nicely to this conference is that we work with um, uh, Disney Junior's Miles from Tomorrowland, uh, animated show about a family in space uh, run by an awesome guy named Sasha Palladino. And what Sasha has done, and intentionally so, he's talked about this, is that he's distributed the storylines between Miles and his sister Loretta evenly. And what has happened is that the audience is 50-50, mm -hmm. male-female. So even though it's a boy titular character and a male showrunner of the show, those intentional changes had quite an impact in resonance with the audience. In fact, um, they uh, have gotten very forceful tweets from girl fans of the shows who are demanding Loretta merchandise before it was available, <laughs> which actually accelerated Disney to pay attention. So there was huge upside from the financial point of view. And so I think that's something else to remember as you think about this is, sort of what are you putting on screen and how is that influencing decisions into the larger economy of the business that you're in, right? Which means we need more people. So how are those images propelling that economy? And then how can you think about decisions like Sasha did where in making just a couple of tweaks in terms of even story time, you could be attracting a much more diverse audience and in turn actually creating more profit for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a great point and, and something we've all talked about as a group is, you know, there's, again, the difference between sort of facts and feelings. There's a, there's a real sort of economic reality around having a more diverse uh, audience and workforce in, in terms of, you know, not leaving opportunities on the table. Um, just in terms of wrapping up here, we've just got a couple of more minutes, and, and I wanted to sort of look to the future with this group um, and, and think about, you know, perhaps we could share just a, a small example of a success story that you've seen in your own organization, um, or really what does sort of that vision of, of a successful future look like? Lisa, I'll turn to you first. Well, we've got two, actually. So one is, um, first thing, is we do external development. I mean, Frankly, the fact that we all, everybody in this room, we are all from all around the world and we work with each other from all around the world, that in itself is creating more diversity in the industry. So I really find the fact that we are doing external development as helping us increase diversity as a whole. It's exposing our teams to new cultures, new people uh, from a variety of different backgrounds and a variety of different contexts and it's, it's doing wonders for, for our team. And the second one is, and this kind of plays on the whole, we had to hire seniors initially, and that there's more diversity and talent uh, going into schools. So we are now starting to hire more juniors. Mm -hmm. And um, we, were, we had a very kind of proud moment recently in the office. We, we looked at our recent hires that, uh, that came in since the, uh, the school year ended in, in the spring. And out of eight uh, new hires that were juniors, uh, only two are Canadian. So uh, six are from elsewhere around the world, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, the Philippines, and Brazil. 
So, and out of those eight as well, three are women. Fantastic. So we're feeling like, yeah, this, this new generation that's coming in, uh, so we're starting to see the benefit of the schools having uh, more diversity as well. And do you find, too, that there's just a, um, it, it's sort of part of the vernacular now, especially with a, the, the younger generation, is that they, they, they maybe don't see those boundaries in the same way? No, they don't. Yeah. Yeah, video games are, are for everyone. Universal. Universal. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Neil, I'd, I'd like to um, maybe just recap with you on, on um, your previous conversation about Bioware and, and the, the sort of diversity within games, uh, because I think we've all mentioned um, here today that when people see themselves in an environment, they're more likely to associate with, with that, that character or, or, or that persona. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that as a point of success for, for Bioware um, and the fans of Bioware? Um, yeah, I think what's, what's important about it from, from Bioware's perspective and my own personal perspective is that, that, that I, you know, I started making games back in the 80s when it was solely the preserve of young white men. Um, and I think the realization that's come with more diversity in the games themselves is that there is real value in, in a diverse workforce because it provides diversity and creativity, and that's essentially what we're, what we're all here to, to push. Um, so I, I think, you know, I've been with Bioware for about five years now, and I th uh, what, what really surprised me when I first, first turned up in Edmonton was that Bioware is a studio that actually has a fan base for Bioware rather than just for the games that it makes. And I think that's largely because uh, the, the, the kind of core DNA of Bioware is, is really enmeshed with this idea of, of diversity, um, not just in the products, but in, in the studios that's, uh, themselves. And I think the great win of this is the recognition by people who perhaps wouldn't have valued a diverse workforce in the past, is that having games that are diverse and inclusive means that you are able to push your creative boundaries a little bit more by, by incorporating those thoughts into the workforce as well as into the products. That's great. Dilber, how about you? Success stories when you look at your, your uh, you know, work as a project manager, when you look at project teams, what, what does a successful team look like for you? Well, I, I was thinking more about um, uh, building teams, mm -hmm. essentially, and uh, one of the things that's great about working at Capcom is I love being a hiring manager. Uh, you know, I spoke earlier about strengths and weaknesses and um, trying to supplement them, and I do the same thing internally as well. We have, there's no cookie cutter positions. Mm -hmm. Like sure, there's an artist and there's a description, but everyone brings something unique to the table. And I try to s supplement their skill set by reorientating the team where possible to help leverage that skill set. So as a hiring manager, um, uh, it's even better at Capcom because uh, our process is just fantastic. What happens is we have uh, multiple people come in to assess things like fit, their uh, a person's uh, um, growth potential, as well as their skill set. And you get all these different, unique perspectives on an individual that's come in for an interview. Um, and so alone, I'm not making these assumptions or decisions. And, it, and I think it helps to be a little bit um, more unbiased. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not perfect, the process. I'm sure there's room for improvement, but I think that definitely supplements um, my way of thinking mm -hmm. um, and to help to encourage diversity uh, and uh, uh, celebrate people's uh, strengths as mm -hmm. well. You make a great point about it not being perfect, and, and I think that's something we would all agree on, that it feels a little bit clunky sometimes to be talking about this, but the fact that we're talking about it is, you know, a, a huge step in the right direction. Um, Julianne and Christy, uh, maybe you can wrap things up for us just with, um, you know, a, a look to what WIA is doing and some of the, the key sort of success metrics. You talked about 50-50 by 2025, Christy, but what else? Are there, are there other things as sort of by way of, of advice that, that you can give to organizations who are wanting to put some of these metrics in place to measure themselves against? Do you want to? Yeah. Oh. I'll, I'll kick off and then, um, you know, I think at, at WIA, we're always thinking about each part of the pipe as well. And so how do we draw those connections between the numbers that Christy uh, illuminated of the sort of art school grads and animation grads that are obviously in higher numbers for women, but it's not translating to the workforce. I think that's something we talk about all the time. I think more research in the space is something we talk about all the time. So um, something for you all to think about with your own organizations is how much do you know your own data? At, at Google, on my professional side of the house, 
we're incredibly transparent about how much we suck at this and that we want to get better. <laughs> I'm being completely honest. And in doing so, we cause the entire tech industry to be transparent. And now there's a level of accountability that's been never before and is now actually happening in Hollywood as well and many other industries. And I think that transparency is something that we talk a lot about at WIA is how can we do more research in this space and actually provide the tools based off the actual metrics to really help people uh, achieve these goals. And so to me, that's a big part of it. Um, and I want to just share a quick success story because I think it's important. We... Um, at Google uh, on YouTube premiered a wonderful documentary called Code Girl uh, done by Leslie Chilcott back in November. We put it on YouTube for five days for free. That had never been done to put a full length documentary. And it followed um, girls around the world building apps to solve issues in their own backyard um, and making them sort of full entrepreneurs. And what's amazing is that um, after five days, we had almost one million views and 2,500 girls signed up for Technovation, the nonprofit, in a week. And that number had been zero the year before on the same date. Cool. cool. And I think what, what I want to just drive home is that this really does matter and it makes an impact and a difference. And that's the only way we're going to see the diversity really happen in the long run is thinking through those things. So based off the data, making strategic choices, targeted choices, and seeing the outcomes. Yeah, we always joke at WIA that, you know, how do we envision the world in our success? Well, there would be no more need for us because <laughs> everything would be 50-50 and, uh, and you know, we wouldn't have any more work to do. But, um, and I do think that this is a, an achievable goal by 2025 and we've already started to make progress. And I think that this is something that involves everyone and um, is going to take a collaborative effort. I get the question a lot, can men be members? Can men be mentors? Can men attend our events? Yes. <laughs> We like men who support women and who want to help us to succeed. Um, we can only ever really move the needle if we all work together, um, you know, and that's across, across the board with diversity. So you know, we definitely want to encourage everyone who believes in the cause to get involved. Um, also, you know, we've talked a lot about how it uh, will impact our culture and, and make a more diverse culture. Um, you know, we started at the beginning talking about how, um, you know, 76% of uh, people working in the game industry are white and, um, you know, 40% of the people playing and buying games are women, yet there's not as many games for them. You know, to speak people's language in the finance side of things, you're leaving money on the table and creating more diverse product means you're tapping into other markets that you might not currently be uh, you know, be uh, tapping into. So it really is for everyone's benefit to, uh, to have diverse product, to have a diverse workforce, and to really move our culture forward. But yeah, great point. Absolutely great point. Um, we are out of time. Uh, I feel like we could talk about this all afternoon. Um, with a, this panel doesn't have a dedicated Q&A time um, in the speaker's corner um, or in the innovation space afterwards, but I know um, the gang is going to be around uh, for part of the afternoon at least, so if there's questions or continued conversations uh, that, that get sparked from today, we really wanted to treat today like a jumping off point to a, a much lengthier conversation. So um, my thanks and gratitude to our panel for sharing their thoughts today, um, and thank you guys for listening. Thanks, guys.